What a resounding applause in honor of Dame Elizabeth Anyongo, the first sickle cell and thalassemia nurse specialist in the United Kingdom. We have the rare privilege of speaking with her about her exceptional career, selfless work, and her most recent prominent role at the coronation of King Charles III. Our special report draws attention to the altruistic nature of the nursing profession globally, as well as the benefits and caveats of international nurse migration. And we bring you the men and women in the diaspora celebrated globally for their exceptional work in the frontline nursing care and midwifery. Welcome to the show. I'm Ijoma Onyato. Let's start off this exciting lineup with a look at the news this week. To commemorate the one-year anniversary of British Nigerian artist Yinka Shonibari's collaboration with London's popular sketch restaurant, its exhibition will be further reimagined to guests' as tables. Sketch has released a new and exclusive line of ceramics which feature a black and yellow filled diamond-shaped pattern, a nod to Shonibari's often disruptive Yoruba-inspired artwork. He says this opportunity gave him a chance to expand his creative process and experience his art in a fun and relaxing setting. Last year, Sketch celebrated its 20th anniversary by inviting Shonibare an architect and designer India Madavi to transform the gallery room with 13 art pieces under the title Modern Magic. For a limited time, Shonibare's artwear is available for delivery to the UK or collection from Sketch London. In this room, who is in utter dis... Nigerian-born politician Yemi Mubolade has made history by becoming the first black mayor of the city of Colorado Springs in the United States. Mubolade moved to the US in 2010, and despite the city's largely conservative demographic, he hit the ground running, co-opening two restaurants as well as a church created alongside the Christian and Missionary Alliance. In 2019, the father of three became the vice president of business retention for the Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce. And up until last year, he was the city's official development manager for small businesses. During his swearing-in ceremony, the political newcomer said, Today, it matters for a lot of black kids because it tells them that the sky is the limit and that they too can come into the arena and lead. Teniola Oyitayo with a Diaspora Network News Wrap from London. The nursing practice is at the heart of all healthcare systems and strong evidence continues to emerge linking patient outcomes to nursing staffing and nursing practice environments. Here's a look at some of the nursing specialists that have received recognition for their exceptional contributions to health and healing. Nigerian British sickle cell and thalassemia specialist nurse and consultant Dr. Lola Iyabodeoni is an honorary lecturer at King's College London University and the University of West London. She received an Officer of the British Empire Award from Her Majesty the Queen in 2004 for her contributions to the NHS. She was also recognized in 2010 by the Nigerian High Commission to the UK for her outstanding service back home. In 2021, she was honored with a fellowship by the Royal College of Nursing for her exceptional commitment to advancing the science and practice of nursing and the improvement of health and patient care. Dr. Luremi Adewale has over 20 years of experience in Canada as a trained nurse and community advocate with an intersectional approach. She currently works as a mental health nurse consultant in Ontario. Dr. Adewale is known for her expertise in the field of health and social services. She has a doctorate in education, a master of science in nursing, a bachelor of science also in nursing, a registered nurse diploma, and mentors skilled immigrants, undergraduates, and master's nursing students in Canada. In 2011, she was recognized by a major municipality for her work in addressing public health concerns and providing psychosocial support to the vulnerable. In 2018, 
This passion birthed the registration of a Canadian not-for-profit and charitable organization called Women Focus Canada Incorporated. Remy is dedicated to inspiring, empowering and improving the lives and well-being of communities. Yemi Siosho is another outstanding leader and mentor in the profession. She started as a midwife in Nigeria before moving to England to study. Her studies led to a successful nursing career, championing and advocating for quality health, social care, compassionate care and best outcomes for patients. The London South Bank University graduate received an MBE from King Charles III during a ceremony at Buckingham Palace in March this year. Yemisi was also elected councillor in London and was mayor of the borough of Waltham Forest in 2017. For her service to the community and the NHS particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, she received the Member of the Order of the British Empire Award in honour of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's birthday at a ceremony in 2022. While nurses are critical to an effective healthcare system, there's a dramatic shortage of nurses and midwives globally, and that's linked to relocation. Let's take a look at how some countries are handling the push and pull factors that incite international nurse migration. The nursing profession is one that could be described as an art, a science and a skill. It combines creativity observation experimentation and testing of theories. It also requires fundamental respect for human dignity, care and empathy, which are all critical to the healing process in particular and achieving universal health coverage in general. Nurses play a critical role in healthcare, from disease prevention, counseling and drug administration to delivering primary and community care. This noble profession has evolved considerably over the last century, leading to the introduction of specialist areas like ambulatory care, cardiac, dialysis, sickle cell, geriatrics, mental health, neonatal oncology and pediatrics, where nurses have gained proficiency. Globally, the demand for nurses remains high, and projections suggest that such demand will substantively increase owing to advancement in technology, increasing demands for specialist health care and changes in demographics. The World Health Organization's 2022 report shows that about 27 million men and women make up the global nursing and midwifery workforce. This number accounts for 50% of the global health care workforce. A statement by the organization in April this year also revealed that there is a need to prioritize investment in education and skills relating to healthcare in order to avert a projected shortage of 10 million health workers by 2030. But there are changes in the workforce, with the rising rate of international migration globally, and nurse migrants are active participants in this movement. In May this year, the National Association of Nigeria Nurses and Midwives disclosed that more than 75,000 nurses and midwives have relocated abroad in the last five years for better career opportunities, higher wages, or better working conditions. This phenomenon, popularly referred to as brain drain or DAPA syndrome, has posed several challenges to Nigeria Human Resource for Health. Just as this movement takes a toll on both donor and host countries, the contribution of nurse migrants around the world are far-reaching, impacting GDP growth, social security, brain gain, as well as cultural and societal dynamics. Because of these potential benefits, nurse migration can be seen as a double-edged sword.
Nursing encompasses autonomous and collaborative care of individuals of all ages, families, groups and communities, which this comes with a level of responsibility. Experts believe although the migration of nurses from less developed to more developed countries is an inevitable part of globalization, an ethical and supportive framework is needed to address key challenges in the noble profession and improve global health care delivery. And the world watched with rapt attention when she carried the sovereign's orb in the royal procession at the coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla. So, who is this celebrated British Nigerian who went from living in a children's home as a young infant to becoming a commander of the Order of the British Empire? This is the exceptional woman who fought to make Britain's National Health Service fair. Her mother, Mary Furlong, was Irish, and her father, Lawrence Odeatu Anyong, who was once Nigeria's ambassador to Italy, was born in Onisha, in the southeastern state of Anambra. Even though she's a child of two worlds, born in 1947, Professor Dame Elizabeth Neka Anyong was brought up in care until she was nine by nuns at the Nazareth House Convent in Birmingham, England. She was inspired to become a nurse at the age of four because while she was at the convent, a wonderful nursing nun treated her childhood eczema in an expert and sensitive manner. After years of studying, she accomplished her dream and started her career with the NHS as a school nurse assistant in Wolverhampton at the age of 16. But not long after, she became dissatisfied with a health system that put less value on people from diverse cultures. Dame Elizabeth then put a substantial amount of her life into her work as a nurse, health visitor and tutor, working with black and minority ethnic communities in London. In 1979, Dame Elizabeth became the UK's first sickle cell and thalassemia nurse specialist and contributed immensely to the establishment of the first nurse-led sickle cell and thalassemia screening and counselling centre in Brent. In 1988, she was awarded a PhD from the Institute of Education, University College London, and worked as a senior lecturer at the Institute of Child Health UCL from 1990 to 1997. Dame Elizabeth was also appointed Dean of the School of Adult Nursing and Professor of Nursing at the University of West London. She established and became the head of the Mary Seacole Centre for Nursing Practice until her retirement in 2007 when she was honoured with an award of Emeritus Professor of Nursing. In 2020, Dame Elizabeth released her memoirs, Dreams from My Mother. The book has been described by many as a page-turner. It uncovers the layers of her life and tells a trailblazing story of how she overcame a background of stigma and discrimination to dedicate her life to fighting inequality. For her outstanding contribution to nursing in the UK, she's received much recognition and several awards. In 2001, she was awarded a CBE by Prince Charles at that time for her services to nursing. In 2004, she was presented with the Royal College of Nursing Fellowship and the Queen's Nursing Institute awarded her a fellowship in July 2018. As part of the celebrations for the 70th anniversary of the National Health Service, she was included in the list of the 70 most influential nurses and midwives in the history of the NHS. Dame Elizabeth was honoured with the Order of Merit in 2002 and a Damehood in the 2017 Queen's New Year's Honours list for her services to nursing and the Mary Seacole Statue Appeal. Her other medals include the 2019 Pride of Britain Lifetime Achievement Awards and the Chief Nursing Officer's UK Outstanding Lifetime Achievement Award, among many others. In her most recent public assignment, Dame Elizabeth played a major role in the royal procession at King Charles III's coronation, where she was charged with the responsibility of carrying the sovereignty orb. Dame Elizabeth has made enormous contributions to the health and well-being of multi-ethnic communities in the UK and her tireless work
to ensure that people affected by sickle cell and thalassemia get the support they need has touched and impacted the lives of thousands. Coming up on Diaspora Network, we sit down with this celebrated British nurse, healthcare administrator and emeritus professor of nursing at the University of West London. Welcome back to Diaspora Network. Let's hear more from this Emeritus Professor of Nursing at the University of West London. Uh, what an incredible career. Um, what a monumental impact you've had on the nursing profession as well. Did you think you would touch so many lives when you started out? Goodness me, no, no. I, I started out as a, a very naive, um, introverted 16-year-old as a school nurse assistant so many, many, many years ago. Mm. And no, I, I would never, ever have envisaged mm. what, what has happened in my career. At what point did you realize that you could make a difference and you were not just an ordinary um, or, or just a regular human being, let's, let's say? I think it was in 1979 when I was, um, uh, I became the first sickle cell nurse counselor. And it included thalassemia, another inherited blood disorder, but sickle cell was the significant condition in the area that I was working in, which was in Brent, in northwest London. Mm. And the impact of being the first nurse in that position um, was more than I really envisaged. So I would, I, that's, that's my answer. What was that like? Actually, it was very exciting. It was hard work sometimes very irritating not the families of course mm. but those in authority that we were trying to say this is a significant condition mm -hmm. sometimes it really felt as though you were banging your head against a brick wall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we, we saw a lot of you you know in terms of your activism um, you you would push for real change um, at a time when it was not uh, the norm what, what did you have to do to turn your interest to activism, shall I say? Well, I, I call it the three Ps. So there was the personal perspective, the uh, professional and the political. And, and, and I, re looking back, I realised I was mixing all that together mm -hmm. with others. First of all, you can't do it on your own. This was very much uh, not just a team effort, but the involvement of those affected by the illness. First of all, the lack of knowledge of nurses and doctors, I myself, had never been taught about the illness. And I trained as a nurse in London in the late 1960s and as a health visitor in the early 1970s. I never had a lecture on the illness. That was probably the most startling thing for me when I realised it was an important condition where I was practising as a health visitor. Do you think that was because it was among um, perhaps Africans and Caribbeans? and there wasn't much um, research going on for that demographic at the time. I think it was because those that were teaching us, the nurse tutors that were teaching us, had not been told about it and also did not probably move around with people who would know about the illness. I think we, we, we talk about people living in silos mm. and so there were the conditions that mainly affected the white community and the conditions that were m more affecting uh, the non-white community and those I think well not I think I know got lesser attention and while she describes her career using three P's as an acronym she talks about how anger became one of the drivers of her activism and I actually got very angry John. I was <laughs> very so anger actually I, I talked about the three P's I think you have to put an A in there somewhere mm. so it's because anger drove me um, but coming back to some of those P's Personal, I found my father by, by that time and discovered I had a cousin with sickle cell anemia in my own family. Mm -hmm. That does make it more. You sit up then when yeah. it affects your own. And um, political, with a small p, I was starting to get interested in the politics of healthcare. How come some conditions get more resources and other conditions don't? How do we convince the politicians uh, that this is not equitable. So that's 
why I talk about the three P's mm. that really influenced my actions with others. And I have to say, I was working with a, a wonderful consultant haematologist, yeah. blood specialist, who sadly is now deceased, the late Dr. Misha Brozovic. I must mention her because she was my mentor. She was the one who said, Elizabeth, you know, you can do this. I had seen that nurses specialized in sickle cell in America. I'd been over to see some cousins, some Nigerian cousins mm. in Los Angeles. And I was started to get interested in sickle cell at that point. And I, that was the first time I realized nurses ha ha could specialize in this condition. There's a glint in her eye when she speaks about writing her famous memoirs that capture a difficult childhood scarred by the stigma of not knowing her father, difference and taunting because of the color of her skin. My mother never gave me up for adoption. I, I was aware of that. Uh, nobody ever spoke about my father. That, that, that. Uh, and so I never understood why, why my skin color was brown because I didn't meet a brown, I didn't meet a non-white person until I was 18. I never asked about my father and, uh, until I was 25. Um, it, it, you know, when something's not talked about, yeah. you somehow realize you, you don't talk about it. Yeah. But I realized the psychological impact it had, been, it had made on me even as a very small child in the children's home, mm -hmm. where there were no other black children at that point, I washed my face 10 times to try and become white. Mm -hmm. And it was with very raw, rough carbolic soap. And I have very, very sensitive skin. And I ended up in sick bay in the children's home. How do you deal with difference and, and, and stereotyping? Because obviously the society has moved on, mm -hmm. but the, the, the pain is there. It's very real. How do you deal with that for everybody watching today who's thinking, I can relate to that and this is something I'm going through? What do you do? Well, gradually, and I think certainly when I met my father, um, the jigsaw, as I call it, of my identity, the black and the whiteness, I understood it. But also, you know, my mother's family, which were Irish heritage, um, they they did love me, they, they did as much as they could. Uh, and I had no sense of rejection from them. Neither from my father's family when I met him. And uh, I was to know my father for eight years before sadly he died quite young. And do you know, it was the most marvelous period for me meeting him. Mm -hmm. He gave me the most enormous hug. I mean, you know, that's what father, yeah. you know, lost father should do, give the child a big hug. She proudly identifies as of Irish Nigerian heritage and tells us how she shows off her culture with pride on the world stage. But there's a lot of buzz about you online, obviously, uh, after the coronation, seeing you carrying the sovereignty oh, yes. orb, and etc. <laughs> how, how do you respond to all that? There was such talk about your outfit. Um, and we, when, you, when we look at in, information about you online, you always have something Nigerian about you. How, how, what's all that about? I love the Nigerian outfits. Um, I, I'm not, I, I'm not into clothes. Sort of, I'm not a fashion person or anything like that. Um, but I find I feel very comfortable in the uh, the lace outfits and the gele. And I'm very short, so the gele gives me a <laughs> bit of height anyway. But I I love it. I I feel fantastic in it. Mm. And uh, I have been overwhelmed by the response. I have to say. Um, it took me two days to recover, to be quite <laughs> honest, you know. But um, Nigerians, nurses, my family, um, I'd slightly forgotten the coronation was going so global. Mm. I have to be, I did not envisage the response. Mm. And I'm very pleased that it's, you know, Nigerians have said how proud they are um, of my contribution. And in terms of the impact of her contribution, Dame Elizabeth saw firsthand just how many lives she's touched at the prestigious Pride of Britain Awards in 2019. So hers is a story of resilience and passion for the profession she loves. She's quick to give counsel to some who still discriminate against others in the workplace. We're all capable of stereotyping negatively and positively. So we, we have to look at ourselves some as well as be aware that it's going on externally. There's some stereotypes um, that 
can be uh, um, addressed, say this is not right, but I think it's our own behaviour um, and I think it's educating other people about why this stereotype is wrong. I think you have to ignore some aspects of stereotyping, other, otherwise it will overwhelm you and drown you in a way. Um, be confident about who you are, but not arrogant. And find out what is it that friends like about you, the professionals that you work with like about you, because that will tell you a lot about the good points about you. Also listen to some of the negatives. It can be very hurtful, but we have to have the humility to accept that we're not brilliant at everything. What an amazing story of sacrifice and service to humanity. It just goes to show how one determined person can make such a major contribution to humanity. And that's the show. You can catch all episodes of Diaspora Network on our YouTube channel. And of course, there's a lot more on our website. I'm Ijoma Onyato. See you next time. <laughs>